What is up, Lee Summit Campus, online campus? We have been going through an amazing study that has blessed me so much personally. I pray that it's blessed you too. We've been studying this ancient letter from the Apostle Paul written to this ancient church of the first century in the city of Thessalonica. We've called them the Church of Irresistible Influence. And that is why they are a model for us to follow. We aspire to be that church of irresistible influence. Remember, we're in the irresistible campaign for the next two years. We're looking for irresistible ways to put God's love on display, living proof of a loving God to a watching world. That's what the Thessalonians were. They had influence far beyond the region. We learned in chapter one that they were known for their irresistible faith, their irresistible hope, their irresistible love. They were known for their irresistible life change. They were known for their irresistible authenticity. They're being led by leaders of irresistible integrity. And this was a church that was irresistibly ready. They were thoroughly watching and believing for the second coming of Jesus Christ in their lifetimes, as we should today in our lifetime. We're living in the season of the second coming. Chad Glover, our teaching pastor, is going to pick it up today, right where we left off a week ago. I'm so deeply thankful for Chad Glover, our campus pastor down the crossroads, our teaching pastor at Abundant Life. Would you give it up right now for Chad as he takes the platform of Abundant Life? All right, all right. Hey, hey, get your clappers, find a copy of God's Word. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 is where we're going to be at this morning. We are coming to you, wherever you're at, from the heart of Kansas City. We are in the crossroads of Kansas City. Y'all let them hear y'all one more time. Crossroads, let's go. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm still, we're still kind of still in the new. So we took an old plumbing warehouse and we turned it into a church house. And we've been gathering for the last few months. And man, we've been having church in the heart of Kansas City. And it's been so awesome. And so um, with that, would you grab 2 Thessalonians chapter 3? And I don't know how your summer's been. Um, I got to share this with the Crossroads campus a couple weeks ago. But on the hottest weekend of the summer, the inevitable happened in the, cross, or in the Glover household. Um, my AC went out. You know, and, and it was, I don't know how, how your household works, but if we don't have air conditioner, that, that's a problem in the Glover household, all right? Like all, my pastor sauce, whatever that is, that, that left me quick, you know? And so my wife, she was the MVP. She was holding it together. Uh, but I was just a little bit like, we, we, gotta, we gotta figure out something now, you know? And so I don't know if you're anything like me, but uh, like I was taught to be resourceful growing up. So we had a lot of duct, duct, a lot of duct tape in, in my uh, household. And, um, and so I did what probably some of y'all would do. I start calling everybody I know that has any sort of HVAC, uh, you know, any sort of understanding of how this thing works. And so I get out there and, you know, somebody's telling me it's like the flux capacitor. I don't even know what that means. And um, so I'm pulling parts off and, and uh, eventually I have a guy and he's like, I think that your fan's out. And I'm like, all right, what does that mean? He said, well, you need to get a fan replaced, but really it's going to be some time. And so I said, man, is there anything that we can do? And he's like, well, I mean, I guess you could put a fan on top of the unit. And so I was like, all right, we can work with that. So I went to the store and I bought a shop fan and you can see how I rigged up my unit right here. This is a shop fan sitting on top of my AC unit. Only thing this is lacking is some duct tape. You know what I'm saying? And so that's the only thing that's lacking there. And, and this bought us a couple of weeks, y'all. And, uh, and I, I was frustrated when my AC unit went out. I don't, again, I'm out there like trying to do CPR on the thing. And, and then I'm like, come on, Chris Jones, I need you to sign the contract. I need you to get in the game. You know what I'm saying? And, and like, I was just all of these, cause I'm like, you're an air conditioner and because you're an not working, the whole household is in disarray. And the reason why I start there this morning is because Paul's going to tell us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that when a Christian doesn't work, the whole household of God is in disarray. And he's going to call us to be hard workers, and he's going to point us to his own example and also point us to the example of Christ. And what he's going to say is if you claim to be a follower of Christ and you're not a hard worker, then there's something that's off there. If you're taking notes, I've titled this message, Irresistible Work, Irresistible Work. And what we're going to see in this final chapter of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is that Paul, he's going to invite you to pray for him, and we're going to pray for our leaders this morning. And then he's also going to spend the lion's share of chapter 3 encouraging us to, to work hard. And before we leave this morning, he's going to remind us of the cool breeze of God's peace. 
Now, again, when it comes to Paul and this group of people in Thessalonica, I mean, he loved these people. And, you know, he, he was all about the people in Thessalonica. He even gets a little bit nostalgic in the first Thessalonians. And he's like, man, I love you guys. I remember when God got a hold of y'all's lives and y'all were such a, a privilege to be a part of and to do life with. And so Paul's kind of talking to them about that. And he's encouraging them. He's saying, man, y'all keep going. Y'all keep heading down that way that you were going. And then he says, but there's some things I think that y'all have gotten a little bit off about the end of all things. And so Paul, he begins to write to them like, here's a about the, the return of Christ, the day of the Lord. And then he continues in the second letter and he continues down that pathway. He's like, here's how things are gonna play out in the end. And, and no doubt Paul had to write some things about work because I think there were people in Thessalonica, much like the people that are here this morning, that when you hear about the end of all things, there's some of us that kind of get into this mentality like, okay, well, if, if the end is near, then uh, we, need to, we need to quit our jobs, we need to sell everything, and then we just need to kind of bunker down and, and like get this little compound and that sort of thing. And Paul's like, no, 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 you've misunderstood. Like when you understand the end of all things is near, you shouldn't quit all things altogether. You should continue to work hard and live on mission. And so Paul, he's gonna write some things real practically to help this group of people know how to navigate their life. But before he gets to that, before he starts talking about the folks that are loafing around, Paul gets pretty personal. Here's what he says in first, or excuse me, second Thessalonians chapter three. He says, finally, brethren, again, this is a letter written to Christians. And so if you're here and you're kind of faith curious, man, we're so glad that you're here. We say this often at Abundant Life. You don't have to believe to belong here, but we're going to invite you to examine the claims of Christ. But this is a message where the, the target audience is people that have said, man, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm, I've given my life to Jesus. I am following him. And so Paul, that's who he's talking to. So this message is really meant for people that have said, man, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ. And so Paul, he says, finally, brethren, I love this. He says, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for not all have faith. Point number one, if you're taking notes this morning, you could write this down, a real simple point. Here it is, point number one, pray, pray. I love this. Paul is just asking them for, to pray for him. I don't know if you know this or not, but your pastors need prayer. And I think sometimes, and the way I was brought up, it's like, you know, you go to the church and you ask the, the pastor to pray for you, you know? Even when I think about Pastor Phil, like I, I rarely think, you know, I should pray for Pastor Phil because he just kind of, like he's taller than me, so I think he's closer to God, you know? And, and I just feel like he's the pastor and like he, you know, he's the guy that prays for everybody, so I go to him, but, but Pastor Phil, he needs us to pray for him. And, and, and then there's been times where, I, you know, I've, I've been almost ashamed to ask y'all to pray for me because I'm like, you know what? I, I'm supposed to be praying for you guys and I do pray for you guys. And we ask that God would move mightily in y'all's lives. And we spend time throughout the week praying for the needs of our body. We, we spend time working or walking the different auditoriums that we gather together and church house leaders, hopefully spend time walking their living rooms or their barns, wherever they're meeting and that they would pray, Oh God, would you move in these people's lives? But listen, your spiritual leaders need prayer too. And so I love this, that Paul just love his humility. He says, finally, guys, would, would y'all pray for me? I spent some time praying for Pastor Phil this week. The reason why he's been out the last couple of Sundays is because he got to take his, his kids on like a once-in-a-lifetime trip down to Maui, Hawaii. Isn't that awesome? And so he got to get away to get some R&R, &R and, uh, and he got down there. And, and when he got down to Maui, Hawaii, he, um, he got into a little bit of a bind. There's been some fires that came through in Maui and Pastor Phil, he got separated from his family. And some of y'all know this story, some of you don't, but there was a time where it was touch and go for them. They were separated for a day, but everyone's fine. They're all together. Well, Pastor Phil makes a post about this on social media. Fox News picks it up. And here's a screenshot of Pastor Phil on Fox News. And I don't know if you got to see this, but they were interviewing him and uh, you know they're asking what was going on. And he's just kind of giving them the facts of what's going on. And then they turn a corner and say, is, was there, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience? And I was so proud of my pastor, y'all. Like he crushed it, y'all. And he just ripped through the gospel in about 60 seconds. And it was awesome. They didn't cut him. He's like, Jesus died to give the world hope, you know. And he just, like he did it, man. And so like I was so proud of him. And we got to pray for Pastor Phil this week. And we got to pray that the word of God would run swiftly and be glorified. And that's exactly what happened. I was talking with Pastor Phil this weekend, and I said, man, what's going on? You know, after this interview, I just encouraged him. I was like, outstanding job, man. You crushed it. Let's go, you know? And he said, man, we're actually able to spend the last day of vacation that we're down here partnering with a local church. And he shot a video, and y'all can watch it right here. Church family, I want to invite you to pray for some dear brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ. These are members of the Living Way Church here in Maui. It's Pastor Greg. God providentially brought us together. So our last day on Maui is a family vacation. 
has become a family mission. We're helping with the relief effort because of your generosity financially. Uh, I was able to immediately help with some supplies, some food, some water. And that's because of your faithful giving that we can act as the body of Christ in a time of crisis. Would you please pray for what's going on in Maui for this dear church family? And uh, we might be coming back as a church to help them in the days ahead advance the gospel in both word and deed. Love you very much. See you soon. Amen. That video just stressed me out. Did that stress y'all out? Like you hear all the boom, 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 you know, and then the kids are getting restless and the parents are like, we're on video, you know, like all this stuff that's happening, right? And that's such, I love that how unpolished that is. That's, that's real life, isn't it? Our, our neighborhood just burned to the ground. Yeah, our kids are a little bit restless and they don't know to stay out of the camera. And yeah, you hear stuff happening because we're trying to get things together. And I love that we were down there, that our, our lead pastor down there of all places to be able to bring calm to be able to bring God's presence, and also to be able to say, hey, we want to help you. We don't just want to pray for you. We want to help you. How awesome is that? And so I, what I want to do this morning, we don't normally do that. I don't know how your Sunday morning is, but I don't know if it was like it, it was for me. Like this morning, you wake up and you're like, you know, it's raining outside. Is this a sign from you, God, that I shouldn't go to church, you know? And so, you know, but you're like, all right, but I get it, get the household together. And then you get outside and you kind of rush to church and you get everyone dropped off and then you rush into here and it just seems like, okay, now it's time to sing. And oftentimes we'll, you know, we'll get to the sermon and then we rush home. And oftentimes I just kind of forget, like, did I actually do what we learned today? And the word of God saying this real clearly, brethren, pray for us. And so we don't normally do this, but I want to just give a, a moment of pause in our message for us to do the thing that God's word's saying to do. And so I'm gonna give us a moment of silence and we're gonna pray. And here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about the spiritual leaders in your life. And so um, at every church house, at every campus, wherever you're watching this, I know this is gonna be a little bit impersonal because I'm coming to some of you from a screen, but God is where you are and the word of God is what unites us. And we're, we're sitting here reading the word of God that leaders are saying, would you pray for us? And so we wanna pray for our leaders. So everyone, if you would bow your head, close your eyes, and I just want to draw to your attention someone in your life that's a spiritual leader. And here in just a second, I'm going to be quiet and we're going to pray for that person. So this could be your campus pastor. This could be Pastor Phil. This could be a spouse. This could be your, your dad or your mom. This could be your community group leader, your ministry leader. Who's that spiritual leader in your life? I'm going to be quiet. We're going to have a moment of silence. And I just want you in this time to pray for them. And you can pray these specific things that we've read this morning, that the word of God would run swiftly and be glorified and that they would be protected from the evil one. So a moment of silence, and then I'll pray for us all. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for our church and the abundance of spiritual leaders that you've entrusted to us. God, I thank you personally right now for Pastor Phil. And God, I, I just pray for him that the word of God would continue to run swiftly and be glorified and that you would protect him from people that are seeking ill intent upon his life. God, that you would give him many more years of ministry, effectiveness, and God, I pray that you would just continue to use him God, I pray for our church house leaders that you would allow the word of God to run swiftly in their homes or their places where they're serving their communities and that it would be glorified and you would protect them. For our campus pastors, that the word of God would run swiftly in our campuses and be glorified and that you would protect them. And for all of our leaders within our body, the moms and dads and, and people that are leading in the marketplace and people that are representing you in all the different areas and spheres of society, God, I pray that the word of God would run swiftly and be glorified, God, and that you would protect us all from, from evil, God, that you would protect us from people that are seeking to bring us down, because not all have the faith, and it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So Paul, he goes on, and he just gives like this really wonderful just encouragement. Here's what he says in 2 Thessalonians 3, starting in verse 3, he just says this, but the Lord is faithful. 
Now, I love this. I know, I know it's not on the screen yet, but that was a great time for y'all to give me an amen, all right? I don't know if y'all, I don't know if you grew up in church, but there's some times where like the word of God, it deserves like a, at least a moo, you know, like a mmm, you know, something like that, all right? All right, and so like uh, we did this last time. I preached this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and Paul says the same thing. For some reason, this group of people needed to be reminded of the faithfulness of God. And I don't know about you, but I am grateful for the faithfulness of God because there's been times where I, I, I did not deserve his faithfulness. You know what I'm saying? I, des- I deserved him to run away from me. And so when I hear that the Lord is faithful, there's a part of me that's like, Praise the Lord, you know? And so we're going to try that again. Then y'all can just say amen. You can move. You can say that's right. You can underline it. Whatever, okay? Paul goes on. He says, but the Lord is faithful. Who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. I love this. And he says, and we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Now, right now, I don't know if you read much of the Bible, but this seems like a really good time just to like for Paul to be like, you know, um, yours truly, Paul, you know, like to sign the letter and it'd be done. You know, like this is a, like, he's like, would y'all pray for me? And like the Lord is faithful and, and y'all, I, we have confidence in y'all. It seems like this would be an appropriate time to end the letter and we would be done and we would be praying and going home, but that's not what Paul does. It's almost like Paul was, you know, writing or dictating this to somebody and they're writing it down and, and he says these things and. And then he like remembered, oh yeah, oh yeah, the people who aren't working. And he's like, I've got a little bit more to say. And so that's what he does going on in verse six. Here's what it says. He says, but uh, we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Now the leather just got dark, y'all. This got aggressive, you know? He's like, he's like, uh, you know the people that are disorderly? Yeah, have nothing to do with them, you know? Like, what did they do that was so bad, I was asking? Well, verse seven, he goes on, he says, for you know yourselves, he says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Here's that word again, dis- disorderly. And it's like, what's so bad about disorderly? What does that even mean? Well, verse eight, keep reading. He says, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked and labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. So Paul, he's getting real practical here. And he's saying that we worked hard when we were with you. And the reason why we worked hard when we were with you is because we were trying to live out our faith in front of you. Point number two, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Work, work. Paul, he's saying, I mean, you got to work. He's charging them to work. Again, some of them had stopped working and they were just kind of mooching off the people that were still working. And I think the, the reason why I was so frustrated when my AC went out is because I'm like, you're an air conditioner. You were made to work and you're not working and this is frustrating and the whole household is hot if you would just work for the love of God, you know, work, right? And I was so frustrated because it was made to work. And I think the reason why Paul is a little bit frustrated with this group of people is because he understood what the Bible teaches. Now, we don't get this here in 2 Thessalonians 3, but, but Paul, the author, he had a biblical worldview. And so what that means is that he believed in Genesis 1 through 3. And when you read Genesis 1 through 3, you find out that God, the God of the Bible, went to work. I think some of us, we think that work is like some, some kind of cursed thing that we must do in order to survive. And, and there's parts of that that are true, but work was designed to be a life-giving thing. And God, he went to work. I mean, think about this. God worked six days and he rested seven. God, the the God didn't have to do anything. For some reason, he said that the way that I made the world was by going to work. And then he makes Adam our first dad. And he says, Adam, I'm I'm gonna make you from the dust of the earth. And then he says, I'm I'm gonna give you a job to do. The first thing, the first commandment is for Adam to go to work. Before Adam ever got a woman to love, he had a work to do. That, that's a word for some of y'all. If you, if you want a wife, do you got a job, all right? That's that starting place, okay? If you ain't got a job, I would say you ain't ready for a wife, okay? Anyway, so that's what God said. He went to work, and, and this was all before there was ever any sin. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that Paul understood that work was something that was wonderful. It was meant to be a part of the human experience. That, that when we go work, it's an invitation to do God-like things, to cultivate to to take the wild rugged out there and make it come into order and to do something that's very godly. 
And so Adam, he went to work, and Paul, he knew this, and, but Paul also knew the paradox of work and, and that there is a fall, there is a curse. And so we know in Genesis 3 what Paul knew, that, that because of the fall of man, because of the sin of the world, work is now difficult. It says that we're going to, by the sweat of our brow, we're going to bring up thorns and thistles at times. And so Paul knew the paradox that, that work is both sacred, but also it's very, very difficult and tainted. But this doesn't minimize the call for the Christian to work. And so Paul, this is, the, this is the angst that he's feeling. He's like, he's frustrated, just like my AC, I, I, it's made to work. I was frustrated, Paul's frustrated when a Christian is not working. So he says that they're disorderly. This word disorderly that Paul uses a couple of times, it's, it's really unique here in the New Testament. It, means that they, it literally means that they were out of line, that they're not doing what they were supposed to do. Again, like an air conditioner is supposed to cool a house, a Christian is supposed to work hard. Now, I need to say this, like if you're here listening to this and you're, you're disabled or you're not able to work, like this, this message is not for you. There's a whole different category and so you shouldn't feel this weird sort of guilt because of some injury or accident or, or ailment or whatever. And also, I also want you to think like, I'm not talking about a job per se. I'm talking about the call to work. Like my wife, she doesn't hold a job, like a nine to five, but she's the hardest worker in our household, y'all. Like my girl will be working, you know? I'm like, golly, you're up before me and you, you go to bed after me most days. But she doesn't, she doesn't collect a paycheck. She stays home and she serves our house and she raises our kids and she teaches our kids. And she is the hardest worker in the Glover household by far. And so when, when you look at this, don't think I've got to go out and get a job in order to do this thing. Paul's saying, quit just idly sitting by. You need to have a strong work ethic. And this is a message, unfortunately, that we need to hear in our society. Because what's happened is that we're living in the great resignation, or what, what sociologists are calling the big quit. I've been talking to different business owners and different people that are in you know, high levels of work. And I'm like, tell me what's going on at the job front. And they're like, man, it, it's different now. It's hard to find quality workers. And you'll have somebody that'll sign up to work and then in 15 days, they're already asking for a pay raise. And you're like, pay raise? You just started 15 days ago, you know? And I'll start with another guy and he's like, yeah, I mean, the people ask for a pay raise and I'll say, well, you know, you, you get a pay raise based upon performance. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And, and like, you, you've been late half the year. You have, you've done the bare minimum and you want me to give you a pay raise. That's not how this thing works, but there's a mentality in our society that when it comes to work, we are entitled to just more with doing less. But God's word is saying that you need to be somebody that works hard. Paul, he goes on, he doubles down in verse 10. Here's what he says. He says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Goes on in verse 11, says, For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner. There's the word again, not working at all, but are busybodies. More on that later. He says in verse 12, Now those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. For as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, it means letter, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Verse 15, yet do not count him as an enemy. I love this. Paul just kind of gives a little bit of grace. He's like, don't, don't hate on him, but admonish him as a brother. Admonish just means encourage him. Say, hey, get a job, get to work. You need to work, that sort of thing. Admonish him as a brother. And so Paul, he doubles down on this. He's saying, man, you gotta work. Here's five things that work does from this passage. The first thing that work does, you see right there in verse nine, is that it sets an example. Paul, he said, man, we were with you. When we were with you, we labored and toiled night and day. We worked hard and we set an example. He's already pointed to Jesus in this letter. He said, man, Jesus, he worked hard. That, that the son of God held a job. He was a carpenter. He swung a hammer for a living. He worked hard. And the point is this. If, you, if you're here and you claim to be a Christ follower, you should be the hardest worker in the office. You should show up and people shouldn't have to question whether or not you're gonna bring your best. You may not be the smartest, you may not be the most talented, but if you're a Christ follower, you should be the hardest worker in the office. Why? Because you're not working for your boss. You're working for God Almighty. God sees you working and we are called to work as unto the Lord. And we bring our best because God deserves our best. We bring our, our most excellent because we serve a God that is most excellent. We put forth our best effort because God Almighty is awesome and he is worthy and he is deserving of that. And that's the mentality that we have. You set the example. I wonder, does your work life, does it underscore the fact that you're a Christian or undermine the fact that you're a Christian? 
You know what I mean by that? Like if somebody found out that you were a Christian at the office, would they be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That brother's working hard, man. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that he claims to know an excellent God by the, by the way that he or she works. Or would they be like, that dude's a Christian? <laughs> Could have fooled me. You know, like how, how would they have responded to knowing that you claim to be a Christ follower? See, it's at the job that we live out the vision that we have here at Abundant Life. Our vision at Abundant Life is to be living proof of a loving God to a watching world. And it's at the job that you do that. We come in here and Mario does a great job. Brayden does a great job. Skylar does a great job. Caleb Shaw, everybody does a great job coming in here, getting us all fired up to be living proof of a loving God when we come in here and worship God through our singing. But that's easy, y'all. It's when you go out to the office tomorrow. It's when you get the case of the Mondays, right? It's when you hit Wednesday or Thursday. It's when life gets difficult in the office place and you get squeezed. That's when you are living proof of a loving God to a watching world. You are called to be an example at work. Work, it not only does it set an example, but the, the second thing that it does, we see here in God's word, is that it provides for people. This is real practical. I love this. Paul just simply says, um, if someone doesn't work, they shouldn't eat. You know, you know, hunger is a great motivator. You know what I'm saying? You ever been hungry? You know, you're like, you'll figure something out, right? And Paul, what he's saying is like, if, if somebody's not working and they're able and they're capable you don't need to enable them to, to continue to stop working, right? I think sometimes in the church, like we just, we feel bad when, when we don't help somebody out. And so oftentimes we'll help meet an, an immediate need. And, and, and oftentimes when we do that and we don't see the bigger need, we're, all, we're not actually helping that person, we're hurting that person, you know? And so like, like if, if somebody's able to work and then you continue to enable them not to work, that is not kind of you. And Paul's saying, if somebody's a Christian, if they're a Christ follower and they're not working, but they can work, they should work, right? I don't, I don't want to be mean, but let me just say this, okay? Because I work with a lot of young adults. And, and if you're here and you're a parent of a young adult and that young adult is still living in your basement and they're 30, all right? And they're, they're not paying rent and you're just like taking care of them and they're still eating out of your refrigerator. Like, I don't know that you're helping them, all right? They need to leave the nest and get a job and they need to have a job for a while. This is a good thing. And functionally, when we work, it provides for people. I mean, this is how, I think this is common sense, but I think we've lost this in our entitlement era, that we think that we should get something for nothing. That's not how it works. And the word of God is telling us that the way you think biblically is if you don't work, you don't eat. Next one is this, five things that work does. It sets an example, provides for people. The next thing is it prevents disorder. Again, in verse 11, Paul, he warns against the person that's just kind of idly not doing anything and they become a busybody, busybody. Paul, he wrote to Timothy to tell the people in Ephesus, like you need to tell them, hey, don't be idle, don't be a busybody. I don't know if you've learned much about being a busybody. I, I really didn't know much about being a busybody. You know, a busybody is somebody's in other people's business, you know. I said this to another group of people, you know, it's like, a, it's like the Gladys Kravitz, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, about four of you knew exactly what I was talking about, right? And that just lets us know what's going on here in the crossroads. Gladys Kravitz was on a show called Bewitched, which was long before your time, <laughs> right? And so, and she was just kind of the caricature, caricature busybody. She was in everybody's business and kind of the town gossip. And, and we don't have a Gladys Kravitz to look to and to kind of, you know, make fun of and laugh about and then to see in our own life. And so oftentimes, like when it comes to being a busybody, like, you know, I'm like, well, what's the big deal? You know, like, yeah, you should mind your own business, but what's, what's the big deal? Well, when you read the Bible, it's a really big deal. I didn't realize it was such a big deal. One of Paul's contemporaries, a guy named Peter, who walked with Jesus, uh, he wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 4. He said, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer. That's a big list, right? Like, I don't, hopefully you're here and you don't want to be in that company, right? Where you say, man, I, you know, Peter's saying, hey, hey, don't be accused of being a murderer, a thief, an evildoer. And then he says, or as a busybody in other people's matters, right? And so it's like, like in the Bible language, you have like people on death row and busybodies right next to each other, okay? <laughs> like this, so it's elevating the busybody into a category. Like, I don't know, man. My hunch is that Peter knew somebody that he was doing life with that was a busybody and he didn't know how to tell them. And so he got a little passive aggressive. He's like, you know, you don't want to be a murderer or a busybody. 
you know, like, and so like, it's, I, I don't think that's what happened. I think the word of God was written really intentionally. And I think that what we're seeing is that God takes these matters real serious. And there's a tendency for us, especially in the church, just to kind of have these acceptable sins. And you're like, well, I'm not a murderer. Like, yeah, but mind your own business, you know what I'm saying? And Paul, he would say that you need to get a job so that you're not a busybody. Again, we don't have a Gladys Kravitz. We don't have a Bewitzed anymore. And so I was curious, like, how do you know if you're a busybody? So I did what most people do these days. I asked artificial intelligence. You know, how do you know if you're a busybody? Here's what AI said. Artificial intelligence, they said that here's how you know if you're a busybody. You're excessively curious. You thrive in drama. You invade other people's privacy. You gossip. You offer advice when no one asked. And you lack confidentiality pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, artificial intelligence nailed it. They know what many of us don't know. And we have this tendency, again, to have this kind of acceptable sins in the church. And so what we'll do is that we may be a busybody, but we cloud it in the veil of spirituality. And so we'll say things like this, you know, uh, well, well, we need to pray for them. Well, what did they do? Well, you know what they did. She was sleeping with this guy, and then he was, you know, and it's just all that you just stir up the drum. I'm just like, what are we doing here? We're not praying for anybody. We're gossiping. We're a busybody. Or we'll say, you know, I'm just trying to help them. No one asked you to help them. You know what I'm saying? Like you're inserting yourself into that situation. So here's three questions to ask yourself to try to see if you're a busybody. Because here's what I know to be true. Most busybodies don't know it. Like, like I've never had somebody come forward at the end of a service, like, pastor, man, I need you to pray for me, man. I'm like, what's going on? I just, I'm just so convicted. I'm so convicted. Well, what's going on? I'm a busybody. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that, right? We do this recovery ministry where people talk about their testimony. I've never heard somebody say, I have a new life in Christ and I'm, and I'm being delivered from being a busybody. I've never heard that. And so oftentimes we just don't know that we're in other people's business. So here's three questions to ask yourself. Question number one, do you try to help solve problems that you're not involved in? You know, do you find yourself saying, you know, well, if it were me, this is what I would do. Well, no one asked you, you know what I'm saying? Here's the, the second question. Uh, do you find yourself getting in the car after meeting with some people and just talking about them for the first 10 minutes of the ride? You know, like you just have dinner with my family and then you get in the car and you're like, oh, the Glover kids are crazy, you know? Like, you know, they need to get some stuff and you just kind of talk, talk, talk and you just kind of stir up all of their stuff and you just mind your own business, you know what I'm saying? Here's the next, next question. Do you troll for drama on social media? You know, just doom scrolling till you find some sort of contention between you and your family and you just chime in thinking you're gonna solve it, you know what I'm saying? You may be a busybody. And what Paul's saying is that if you're a busybody, this is not pleasing to God. If you claim to be a follower of Christ, but you're in everyone else's business, what Paul practically is saying, get a job. And when you get a job and you work hard, you don't have time to worry about everyone else's stuff. You don't have time to, to sit out and watch through the front window about what's going on in the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? And then go comment about it. You don't have time for that when you're working hard at the things that God's called you to do. Five things that work does, it sets an example. It provides for people. It prevents disorder. And the next thing is it, just real practically, it makes you weary. It makes you weary. Paul says here in verse 13, and don't grow weary in doing good. Work is both good and it's wearisome. Many of you have come in here and I just want to be sympathetic to you. Like you're tired of your job. You've been working hard. You've been grinding at the office and you're in a difficult season. And, and I would just say this, the Bible's not aloof to that reality. And so if you're weary, that's normal. Work makes you tired. That happens. And I think sometimes when I work with, with young professionals, they'll hit the job for us. And like 27, they've been working for two years. And they're like, man, I'm, so, I'm tired. I'm ready to retire. I'm like, you're 27, right? Don't be naive. Work is exhausting. Work is tiresome. And I'll talk with people that are, aren't in other seasons of life. They're like, man, I'm so exhausted. I'm like, well, you, you need a spouse. And then you need some kids. Then you'll know what tired is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> work is tiresome. It makes you weary, but also it's good. And so Paul, he's saying, I know that you're weary, but don't grow weary in doing good. So from the trash man to the teacher, 
From the lineman to the lawyer, from the ditch digger to the doctor, all work is sacred in God's, God's eyes. And there's ups and downs to every job. Paul, again, he's saying, we labored and toiled night and day. Work makes you weary. There are difficult times, but you keep pushing through. This is normal. And don't be surprised when work is hard and don't minimize the good that you're doing at work. Pastor Philly says this a lot, that your vocation is your mission. One of the greatest goods that you're doing is that you are present in the different spheres of society to represent Christ. And so do your job with excellence, but also share Jesus as the Lord leads. Like, I don't know if you know this or not, but we're a church that, that goes on mission trips all over the world. And so we have people currently out of the country on, on mission trips. And if you've ever been on a short-term mission trip, they're awesome. They're exciting. You know, you, you get to get ready to go to a place and there's lost people in that place. And you think, okay, I'm going to go share Jesus and live on mission. And, and, and then you, you know, you get with your team and you pray up and then you, you it usually costs money. So you got to fundraise and, and then you get to go on the mission trip and God does great things. What if I told you that there's a mission trip that you can go on? Some of y'all mission trip junkies are like, you're perked up right now. You're like, what mission trip? You know, what if I told you there's a mission trip that you can go on where there are lots of lost people that you can go serve and you can share Jesus and this mission trip, you'll get paid to go on it. Some of y'all are like, sign me up. It's your job, all right? Your job is the mission trip, okay? You have the opportunity to deploy tomorrow to go to a place where there is darkness and there is need that people don't know Christ. And we're here to stir one another up around the hope of Jesus so that you can deploy into that place and you get paid on Friday. Come on now, you know what I'm saying? That this is the greatest good that you are called to. And Paul's saying, don't grow weary in that. Don't grow weary. Five things that work does. The number five thing is it finally, it brings honor. It brings honor. Again, in verse 14, Paul says, if they're not working, they should be ashamed. Paul says, when you obey the Lord, you work hard. And so when you don't work hard, you're disobeying the Lord. And this brings shame, not only to you, but to the whole household of God. And some of you are like, man, well, you don't understand my situation. Things are really, really difficult in my workplace. And listen, I, I don't understand your situation. I don't work for your boss. I don't work at the place that you work at. And it may be difficult, but this would be my encouragement to you. When was the last time you invited God to work with you? When was the last time that, I, that, that he, you, you were on your way, you're driving to work and you just said, God, I don't wanna go work, you know, you're just being honest. And when was the last time you said, but God, would you go to work with me today? Who cares about your job the most? God does, I promise you. Who cares about you the most? God does. Who, who cares about you succeeding and being excellent and being the best the most? God does, then why are we so hesitant to ask God to help us in the greatest endeavor that we'll give our waking hours to, our jobs? Now think if we just spent as much time asking God to go to work with us as we did complaining about our boss or our job, man, we may change the world, you know what I'm saying? And so what would it look like if tomorrow on your way to the office, you just had just a three minute, just kind of decompress Jesus Christ would you help me at work today? And that you would go and that you would conquer your day of work and you would bring honor to God and you wouldn't grow weary because when you work hard, it brings honor to God. Now, Paul, he finishes this letter in a really, really Pauline way with a lot of hope. And here's what he says in verse 16. He just wraps up and he says this, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all he says, the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. In verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. So often when we're studying the Bible, we just kind of skip the credits, you know? It's like, you know, like the little skip the credits button on the Netflix series, like next episode, next episode, right? But the, we, we've got we to we, we look at the credits here of Second Thessalonians, like a Marvel movie, you know what I'm saying? Like there's something there, you know, like we need to pay attention to the credits, okay? Because Paul, he's not just kind of signing off and kind of, you know, coasting into the end of this. He's dropping some amazing things that he's calling us to rest in. Point number three, and finally, if you're taking notes, you could write this down, just real simple, rest rest. Paul, he's told them a lot about a lot of things and he's signing off by reminding them of some incredible things. He's trying to hem us together with hope. He's saying that there is peace that is available to you from God and there is grace that is available to you from God. He's saying rest in this peace by the grace of God. See, you get God's, God's peace by God's grace.
the peace of God right here in verse 16. It says, the Lord of peace himself will give you peace. It's coming straight from God, straight from the source. It's coming to you. It's personal. He says, he will give it to you always in every way. And so it's available in whatever circumstance that you may be in. You can have the peace of God. My final question this morning is, do you have the peace? Do you have the peace of God? You have that internal settledness that you're right with God, that no matter what you face, are you resting in the peace of God? When my AC unit went out, y'all, like again, I, I, I kind of Southern engineered this thing, put the big fan on it, and, and it worked, y'all. It worked for a couple of weeks, but I, I knew like this was a temporary thing, and my wife reminded me that as well. And so anyway, you know, it's like a 33-year-old unit, and I knew it, it had served its time, all right, and it was time for us to get a new unit. And I could try to keep patching this thing together, but the inevitable was I needed to replace the unit. And until I got a new unit, there wasn't gonna be the cool breeze of peace in the household, you know what I'm saying? And so we, we made the appointment and last week, y'all, we got a new unit, check this out. Yeah, yeah, woo, like Christmas morning for me, right? So I was excited, you know, we got a new unit, but who was really excited were my kids and my wife, you know, and, and, I, and I went in there and I see the kids just kind of skipping around like their hair's blowing because it's so breezy in there now, you know? And, and, and they got the peace of a cool breeze at no cost to them. But I had to pay for it all. And I've made a commitment that I will keep paying the electric bill every month, Lord willing. And so here's the point, my children have the blessing of the breeze of peace at no cost to them but it costs their father greatly. And the reason why I share that is because the only way that you can have the peace of God Almighty is if you understand that God, your heavenly father, paid the price so that you could have the cool breeze of God's peace in your life. And that you could come in here and if your life is an AC unit, you could try to put a fan on yourself. You could try to patch things together, but the Bible teaches inevitably, you're gonna need a new unit. You're gonna need a new heart, if you will. And the Bible teaches that you and I, we were dead in our sin. We were broke down from the get-go. And the only way that we can be made right with God, the only way we can have peace with God is by recognizing that we are broken on the inside and that we need a new heart. And the good news is this, is that Jesus paid the price so that you could have a new installation. And that he is an expert installer and he warranties his work, y'all. And not only will he pay for the installation, but he'll pay the bill for the rest of your life. The grace of God. And so my question is, do you have peace? Are you at peace with God Almighty? You could go out and you could crush the workforce. You could be a seven, eight, eight digit person. You could, be, you could get it all, but not have the peace of God and miss it all. And so don't leave this morning without having the peace of God that Jesus gave his life for you and I on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the grave so that you and I would know without a shadow of a doubt that his grace is sincere and that his sacrifice is true. And his father gave his son so that you and I would have the opportunity to feel the cool breeze of God's peace in our soul. Don't miss that opportunity. I wanna invite you just to bow your head wherever you're at, close your eyes. I just wanna ask you a couple of questions I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna move on to the next thing. Question number one, are you resting in the peace of God? Or are you, inter are you internally in, in turmoil and disarray? You can have peace, but you're gonna need a new installation. And God has arranged an appointment today and his divine crew is on the site. If you'll just invite him in the front door of your, of your house, you could leave with a new unit, so to speak. And God will move in and he'll save you. You just have to ask him. Question number two, how's your work life? Are you working in a way that's an example? Are you working in a way that, that's providing for people, that's bringing glory and honor? Are you doing good? 
And if not, man, invite Jesus to help you at the job. And then, and then question number three, would you continue to pray for our pastors and for our church that the word of God would run swiftly and be glorified? And let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how clear it is. Pray, work, rest. And God, I pray that you would help us to live out your truth in a really tangible way. God, help us to pray for the things that are happening in our lives. Help us to pray for those leaders in our lives. God, I pray that you'd help us to work in a way that would bring you glory, that we would be the most excellent, that the rumor would get out that if you hire somebody from Abundant Life, they're gonna crush it. God, that we would be known for the way that we work hard, that we would be known for the way that we work with excellence, that we would be known for the way that we work with intelligence, that we would be known for the way that we build culture that is, that is congruent with the kingdom of God. God, that we would, be, that we would have a great workforce, that we'd be living proof of a loving God in the workforce. And God, I pray that you'd help us to rest in your peace. God, thank you so much <laughs> that you paid the bill on the cross so that we could have the chance of feeling the cool breeze of your peace in our soul. So God, if we're not air conditioned in our soul, I pray that that would be a reality for us as we step into a right relationship with you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can you give the Lord a hand?